all looked about this. <laughs> welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. Um, we are a little bit behind schedule, exactly 20 minutes. Um, so we're trying to speed this up. I hope this will work. Um, before I will do it a slightly different introduction than previously has been happening because I think it's better to introduce as the speakers come in and set up a home for a little bit more time. Um, the next session is called Relational Landscapes. Um, I'm going to introduce, and Chris Hoxie, who's a lecturer in architecture here, is going to be the uh, respondent. We have uh, decided to be co respondent. Um, I'm an um, associate professor here in the architecture department, um, and I'm also a little bit responsible for the um, digital uh, workshops here. Uh, in that respect, I um, have been exposed to the pressure of the digital. Chris has uh, maybe more so been exposed to the subject matter as he uh, teaches here seminars about digital media. Um, and in particular examines the role of um, the still and the moving image. He is also doing a seminar in um, immersive environments and most recently, um, since two semesters, is collaborating with other um, faculty um, on questions of history and theory. Um, so he has developed a preservation project and inquires here in how far the digital media can be of use. Um, furthermore, Chris' work um, has been widely collaborative with many of our faculty. Uh, for example, um, Scott Cohn or Max Gordon, where he developed with them or, or independently uh, media and design systems, uh, most notable for the uh, Godamps Museum uh, for the Second World War, for example. Um, so I welcome Chris Foxy. Um, then I could not resist Charles, and I hope you uh, forgive me to write about one paragraph, not where it would be taking me probably a minute. Please. Yes, uh, to respond to this, and um, as I looked at uh, the presenter's work uh, very briefly yesterday, um, I came to the conclusion that we're not only talking about relational landscapes, but that we're also, in the meantime, revisiting architecture and landscape. And I think this has to do, perhaps, and this is maybe too ambitious to say that, but it has to be also very much so with the background of the respective speakers we're having here today. So landscapes, um, and how far are they relational, in what sense? Thinking late landscapes relational could suggest the thinking of architecture and landscape as a relational um, condition, could suggest the rethinking of architecture as relational landscape as an active context within which material and organizational boundaries might have to radically be rethought. Once landscape and architecture are understood as being relational, as being in an maybe we could call it ecological exchange with one and another, a critical reassessment of the literal, physical, as much disciplinary boundaries of landscape and architecture might become necessary. This rethinking may also result in a critical reassessment of our design tools and techniques. Traditional design tools and techniques seem only to a limited extent able to analyze, model, or map the temporal and spatial complexity relational landscapes are characterized through. It is perhaps for this reason that paramatic models and interactive maps as currently explored for their potencies to handle cross-scalar and temporal ecologics uh, and resulting phenomena might be of most potency. So let me now introduce the first speaker in the session, that's Andrea Hansen. <coughs> Welcome, Andrea. Andrea is um, the Daniel Urban Kiley Teaching Fellow and Lecturer in Landscape Architecture here at the GSD. And her teaching and research and writing investigates in data-driven landscape infrastructures and urban policy strategies, uh, particularly in deindustrialized cities, um, with an emphasis on the merger of real-time parameters um, and locally specific culture and ecological ephemera. So in this respect, I could see possibly bridging condition for, uh, for between you and our previous speakers. Um, she is also a principal of Fluxscape, a Boston-based firm that inquires in new models of landscape infrastructure for post-industrial cities. Andrea has previously worked in the fields of landscape, architecture, and urban design in LA, New York, Boston, and Shanghai. Um, Andrea holds a master's degree of uh, landscape architecture and, and a master's degree of architecture, both from the University of Pennsylvania. So her talk today is quite complicated. You can read it here. Um, I'm sure I mispronounce this. Is um, the attic amic divide towards cartographic agency. Welcome. Thank you, Inga. So, yeah, I'm calling my presentation today the attic amic divide towards cartographic agency, and I will explain those terms. A while back, I came across uh, a couple of terms uh, out of uh, linguistics. 
linguistics and anthropology, uh, etic and emic, which come from the words phonetic and phonemic. They were coined in 1954 by the linguist Kenneth Pike in a nod to the ongoing debate between social scientists regarding whether knowledge is subjective or objective. So etic in an anthropological sense is an account, uh, is a description of behavior belief by an observer in terms that can be applied to other cultures. Uh, an etic account it tends to be culturally neutral. In a sense, it's an objective account. On the other hand, an emic account is a description of behavior or belief in terms of meaningful, consciously or unconsciously, to the actor. That is, an emic account comes from a person within the culture. So we might say, for instance, that Yorick's work is an etic account of uh, in indignation. Um, and I, I was struck, actually, by Charles's earlier presentation of, of these two modes of thinking about landscape, that, that this is actually a really good framing of the way that cartography is working landscape architecture as well. Uh, because I, I see that there's there's a real divide right now between um, these kinds of top-down or edic approaches where the map is really serving as the determinant as uh, contrasted with a more emic or bottom-up approach where the map takes the stance of being more of your personal cartography or personal narrative. <coughs> So, of course, uh, one of the uh, most well-known examples of this map as determinant mode is uh, Ian McCard's work. This is an article from uh, 1967 in Landscape Architecture Magazine, Where Should Highways Go?, which, as, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, McCard was explaining his overlay method of um, getting to a, a location or a prioritization of this uh, I-95 corridor between Trenton and New Brunswick. So just to go over this in brief detail, uh, a series of transparencies laid sequentially one over the next uh, in order to determine what the most ecologically uh, uh, acceptable route for this highway was to go. We can contrast that with a, a series of personal cartographies that sprang out of the uh, psychogeographic or situationist movement in the 1950s, 1960s in Paris. You're probably also all familiar with uh, The Naked City by Guy uh, Moore. Situationist Doreen's being um, something that was championed by this movement in order to uh, get at the notion of uh, ephemeral conditions in the city or, or really personal experiences that uh, speak to the fragmented qualities of, of moving through a city. They, they, they took uh, these derives or walks around Paris that um, were in essence an attempt to get lost in the city and these, these maps are the, uh, the documentation of these walks. Another individual who was involved uh, tangentially is Paul Henri Schomorgendal, forgive my French, who um, wrote a couple of books the first in 1952 called Paris and its Suburbs, the second in 1956 called The Daily Life of Working Families, in which he tracked the movement of individuals through the city of Paris to get a sense of, of the, the working class or the working poor experience of the city. In 1999, Thomas Sarinen executed a study of children's mental maps of the world in which he asked children from 49 countries to draw over 3,800 maps of their um, perceived uh, map of the world. Uh, and it was quite interesting because uh, this is a map drawn by a child from Thailand, which is actually the closest to the Mercator projection. Uh, in Thailand and many other eastern countries, the child's home country tended to be exaggerated uh, as much smaller than it actually is in relationship to the rest of the world. Whereas in the United States and other Western countries, these home countries were actually exaggerated as much larger. So I'm not here to speak about the political perceptions of geographic boundaries today, but I think it's interesting nonetheless. Then finally, uh, by Esther Pollock and the Wad Society in Amsterdam, uh, these people uh, gave several participants GPS dots to wear in their movements around Amsterdam for 40 days. 
the resultant maps are uh, representative of each individual's version of Amsterdam. So brighter lines indicate places where they traveled more often, whereas lighter lines are a one-off experience in the city. So I'm very interested in a combination of these two modes of thinking about cartography and of mapping. Um, I'm currently applying these two uh, mappings of the deindustrialized city. I will preface this by saying that this is very much a work in progress. And so what you're seeing today is something that maybe uh, I, I would certainly welcome any input that you have on the way that So Philadelphia uh, has over 39,000 vacant parcels, most of which, the vast majority of which, over 90% are small residential parcels. Um, only 4% of these parcels are industrial, but those industrial parcels actually make up 33% of the land area. Um, currently, Philadelphia's industri industrial vacancy rate is 9.1% which is actually down this year from 9.4%. But that's still a gross um, square footage of almost 3 million square feet of leasable space, which is an, a lost opportunity cost of almost $1.3 billion. And so these vacant parcels are, are all, almost all clustered along um, the waterfront or um, areas of uh, decommissioned or abandoned or underutilized infrastructure, such as rail corridors and highways, which are either elevated or subterranean. And what happens with this is that these parcels, when coupled with uh, all of the industrially active zones in the city, are uh, a, a highly impervious network, but also one that happens to coincide with some really critical Areas along the watershed of the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers. So, if we were to consider pairing these with the existing green space networks, I think that um, there's really an opportunity to uh, begin to uh, reactivate, remediate, and restore productivity in some of these vacant industrial parcels and see them not as uh, individual pieces, but rather as part of a larger system. So I'm currently developing a process that uh, is essentially a three-step process. And right now, I'll be showing Philadelphia as a case study. But over time, I'm hoping certainly to bring this to other cities in the US and abroad as well. Uh, the first step of this process is to map the place through a flexible relational framework. So we've seen earlier, uh, I showed uh, the McCarg study of the I-95 corridor in Trenton. Uh, this is a study that McCarg did in Philadelphia in 1992. It was commissioned by the city of Philadelphia to look at the incidence of uh, social and physical disease and how that might correlate with uh, physical conditions in the city. So um, essentially he's taking things that are easily mappable, uh, census data, et cetera, and trying to get at an instance of social disease, which is a really a more subjective quality and something that is a little bit less easily traced. So in my work, uh, I'm trying to think about, uh, I'm calling it McHard 2.0 right now, or a way that we can take the concept of overlays and uh, approaching incidents of characteristics of a city that are much less easily mapped. Um, and so I've developed a process that takes a series of uh, GIS shapefiles, or GIS layers, and mathematically approximates, um, based on a weight value, the incidence of, in this case, emergent vegetation or opportunistic species in the city. Um, I was struck by Stephen's talk earlier today in the work of Dana Talma, because I think that this is doing a very similar thing. Uh, it's, it's taking a mathematical or algebraic average for each individual pixel, but this is something that is an inherently uh, scalable, so it can happen at the level of the city or it can be taken down to the level of the district or the individual parcel. What you're seeing in this video is essentially an adjustment of the weight of each of these layers. 
And so as those weights changes or change, the, uh, the corollary or the summary incidence of this condition changes. So ideally, this is something that could be, be formed as part of a feedback loop. So over time, as these conditions are addressed for their relative weights, these numbers could change and the resultant map changes as well. So I'm essentially looking at five different characteristics of deindustrialized cities in Philadelphia right now. Um, most of which are fairly self-explanatory. Contamination, composed of uh, several layers, superfine and viscosic release, and inventories, brownfields, etc. And this is showing the weight values of those. Uh, material decay, so the incidence of uh, weathering, decomposition of both landscape and architectural surfaces. Structural issues, which um, highly correlated code violations and pending demolitions in the city. And I will say here that while this looks like <coughs> a, just a very pixelated JPEG, it's actually a, each individual square has been calculated for the value um, based on the layering of these layers. Uh, emergent vegetation. So the, these last two uh, are, are heavily correlated with hydrolo uh, excuse me, hydrological conditions and impermeability, impermeable surfaces. So the second step of the process is to take these maps and give them agency. So not only is it a documentation of existing and dynamic conditions in the city, but also it's, it's a framework for beginning to assign various infrastructural strategies based on both edic inputs, so the, uh, the map seen as the edic or the objective uh, documentation of deindustrialization, but also to bring in the idea that there's an EMIC assessment as well. So um, these infrastructural strategies are not only being chosen in a top-down way by what kind of condition is on the site, but also there's some range for subjectivity or what kinds of proposals might be best suited. So I just wanted to show a few things that I'm currently looking at in terms of precedence. Uh, I'm sure many of you have, have played around with some mapping cities that are, are, are taking advantage of various mapping APIs that are out there. Um, one that I came across when I was in college is called The Color of Palo Alto by Samuel Yates. He went through and photographed in downtown Palo Alto uh, each parcel and then using Photoshop averaged the pixels uh, to get at a, a key color for that parcel. He then uh, averaged all of the parcels in the city to get this kind of greenish tone and made a paint color out of it. So, um, you know, this is somewhat interesting as a, it, for its technological methodology. This is going around around 2000, so it's, it's a bit old now. But you, you can also ask the question, what is it actually telling you about the city? What, it, what is it, um, what does this green color actually tell you about Palo Alto? Another project is called 596 Acres by Eric Ralsford, an amateur uh, programmer and cartographer. Uh, he's mapping all of the vacant lots in Brooklyn, and he's also allowing you to see the ownership of this lot as well as uh, begin to organize uh, communities and start to, to do small interventions such as community gardens and such. This is a project by one of my students last year in uh, the Detroit uh, Interrupted Studio that I taught with Tony Griffin. And she put together a, a web survey in which she asked Detroiters to pick their ideal neighborhood. So if they could live anywhere in the city, where would it be? She then asked them to list their, uh, their preferred qualities in the neighborhood. So what were the things that they were looking at if they were to move? Um, she then put this information together in a series of maps that spoke to the subjective qualities of living in a city. So, and she, you know, did the kind of the word mapping and, and all of that to 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 essentially isolate what were the stronger and weaker parts of the city uh, as a first step to potential decommissioning. And finally, 
this is a project by Christian Mark Schmidt called Invisible Cities, in which he is uh, mapping uh, Twitter feeds in Manhattan and uh, adjusting the topography based on the density of Twitter feeds for a particular region. So all of these studies are feeding into um, what I'm trying to do, which is to take this map information and, and allow um, users, whether it's designers or members of the community, to begin to see what kinds of opportunities are out there for vacant parcels. So right now, this is, this is a study in Grasshopper, but ultimately I'd like to, to form this into an interface that can uh, be brought to the public and that actually be used um, not only internally, but also externally as well. So, So these maps are, are based on a very complicated uh, flowchart that I'm not going to go into too much detail, but essentially what you're seeing in green now is the, uh, the, the individual vacant industrial parcels that have been coded with the information from the larger regional map. The user can then go in and select these parcels and information pops up about the size of the parcel uh, as well as the intensity of this issue, in this case emergent vegetation. And then they also are able to, to select the desirability of vegetation for future use. So ranging from absolutely none to a completely lush, uh, potentially you know, entirely vegetated green site. Uh, and then finally, a, a remediation mode is suggested in which they can go and, and research additional options for that mode. And what you'll see is as, um, you can select multiple parcels as well to compare one to another. But as the, uh, the desirability is changed by the user, then the resultant uh, suggested remediation mode changes as well. And this is all based on, on this one right here. So right now you're seeing Right now you're seeing the, the change of the desirability is impacting the type of uh, intervention that happens. And so again, looking at these five conditions, contamination, material decay, structural issues, emergent vegetation, and impermeability, you have a, a really broad range of options for deindustrialized cities that are not only seeing these effects as deleterious, but rather seeing them as opportunities for a wide range of more innovative strategies. And then finally, the third step, which is still in progress, is uh, to catalog these operations and make um, the research of best practices available to members of the public, members of the community. Um, I'm, Looking at it, obviously there are plenty of uh, publications and websites out there that are aimed at uh, cataloging best practices and landscape architecture and other, other fields. Um, Living Systems is one, Lake Margulis and Alexander Robinson. The Out of Water Project is something that they're working on. Uh, it's focused specifically on hydrological intervention. Um, some of you have probably seen the Local Code Project by Nicole <coughs> Monchal. And finally, transmaterial.net, which is a catalog of innovative materials for architectural use. So this is a mock-up of the, uh, the website in progress, where um, you have all of, all of the different types of issues of deindustrialization, uh, social and economic issues notwithstanding. Uh, and then, these uh, flowcharts that I showed earlier are, are now clickable, so you can, you can see what types of, in this case, vegetation these operations are applicable to. And they're then linked with uh, different precedent studies, uh, so that not only are you, are you seeing a mode of remediation, but you're seeing an example of that as well.
And so these continue with, with a lot of different strategies. This is a, a research project that's still underway, but ultimately over time it would be something where not only are these strategies being given to the user, but the user could also start to embed these into the website as well. And so in sum, this is a, a multi-phase process, but um, I'm trying to get at, at a sense of, of a map that is not only a static documentation of what is there, but it's really more of something that can be used to identify, uh, first of all, whether or not remediation is necessary, and second of all, what types of remediation might be available that are not your, your standard modes of practice, but rather more innovative design strategies. So I, I have a, a few things in mind for next steps, uh, and, and some of these are provocations of things that might be useful to speak about later on, but I, I'm certainly interested in continuing to, to embed this work with more information about ephemeral and phenomenological uh, inputs. Um, the notion of the emic is currently present in the ability to adjust the weights of certain factors or to adjust the, um, the desirability of certain types of interventions. But I think it's necessary to continue to embed this hyper-locality of place to give uh, Philadelphia or Detroit or other cities uh, their own specificity. Also interested in continuing to incorporate um, non-plan-based uh, representation a question that's been in my mind quite often, both as in my teaching here at the GSC and in my own work, is how to escape flatland, as Edward Tufte calls it, uh, when, when so much of the available geospatial information really is planar. Um, finally, I'd like to continue testing this on other sites, other regions, and to ultimately uh, make this available to the public. I'm currently working with a group at the Kennedy School. I'm advising them on uh, a proposal where this this project actually is going to be to, to be made into a product that can be made available quite soon. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next, thank you, Andrea. Um, our next speaker is Steve Lally. Um, he is an assistant professor at the School of Architecture at the University of Iowa in Chicago, where he's teaching research and writing things in relation of architecture and landscape design through the vehicle of mixed media installations. Seen as a founder also of Weathers, a Chicago-based speculative design practice, which focuses on the constructing of new environments, climates, and contexts that provide the potential for social interaction, activities, and spatial organizations. Architecture and landscape are envisioned to conflate the materials and phenomena traditionally associated with the natural environment are uh, introduced or perhaps reintroduced into the human habitat. The firm's intention is to foreshadow and draw out the spatial and organizational implications this may have for material and spatial boundaries. Um, Seen holds a Master of Architecture degree from the University of California and a Bachelor of Science and Landscape Architecture degree from the University of, um, of Massachusetts at Amherst. Um, he also is a writer and co-editor um, of soft space from a representation of form to a simulation of space, and was a guest editor of an AD journal issue entitled Energies, New Material Boundaries. Most recently, he received the Rome Prize in Landscape Architecture. His talk today is entitled The Shape of Energy. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, in real time goes fast, so. Um, so what I thought I'd do is kind of walk through the two parts is maybe give a little bit of an idea of the kind of larger arch of some of the work that I'm doing as a practice that propels the work I'm a part of. Um, and then the second part, focus more on this, the kind of title of the shape of energy, which is one component of that. Um, but to, to kind of give a, a little idea of, of, of what this is about. Um, so, as, as architects, or as landscape architects, and I think the discussion was mentioned a minute ago between the inflation or the relational idea of a landscape, between landscape architecture and architecture, um, is essentially that um, to be educated as both, the, uh, the line between the two is, um, is somewhat thin for me. Um, 
But more importantly, regardless of what you call it, for me, the interest is in the materialities that we have as designers to work with. And the fact that the materials you work with are never neutral. And the same thing can be said for your methods of representation. And Robin Evans talks about this, that you have to suppress something in order to release something else. And the same thing goes with materiality. So whether you're talking about glasses of transparency, the work of uh, Richard Neutra, which allows a kind of transparency between connecting the inside and outside, uh, whether you're talking about the advent of iron and steel that allow for large span construction and a lot of um, typologies of the tower, um, the great train stations of the 19th century, uh, or you're talking about concrete and the malleability of it. Each one of these has a kind of relationship between the advent of a material, but also the programmatic and social kind of requirements that were necessary that coincided with it, that allowed these things to happen. So the question that interests me is what materiality are we avoiding or not really looking into fully testing its possibilities? And for me, it's, it's energy. It's energy not as a resource, a fuel, a technology that we index as, as, a, as a way to harness, but actually a material energy that actually can take on the loads of becoming a building block, the same way we think about steel, concrete, what have you. That it can actually define boundaries. It can define physical edges. So to kind of give a, a little example of, of uh, like where this is coming from, or kind of give an analogy to it. This is from uh, the 2008 Olympics that we're all familiar with. And when we think back upon the Olympics, most of our images of the Olympics are these facade systems. When we think back upon the bird's nest, the water queue, um, we think about these large constructions that are the kind of image that we think of, the kind of, of a recognition of the work that was done there. Um, but clearly, the environmental context that these athletes work in is, a, is complete, completely um, influential. And we knew this looking back in Beijing was the fact that they stopped traffic for a number of days in order to correct or bring back some level of um, the air quality so these athletes could run within it. But what was really interesting for me was the aquatic center, which, as you look at it here, you can see looks essentially like a water bubble, you know, on the edges of the building. Um, the discussions that were going on at the time was that if you think back upon, this is sort of the time where if you look at 2008, specifically in swimming, you had, I think it was 70 swimming world records were broken in one year. 68 of them were done at the Olympics. And there was actually one example in which the first five people who, who touched the wall had each broken a world record. Um, and a lot of this was done from two things. The pool itself had thought to become as fast as it was ever going to come. Meaning, a fast pool is a combination of geometries. Um, how deep you make the pool, um, the edges in which the water can, can dissipate out so that you don't have any backwash, you don't have any reverberations from the body getting in the way of the next individual. So really, in this case, the geometry and the surfaces were the, the, the main mechanism of controlling the body and making a faster pool. At the same time, you had swimsuits, where swimsuits were from toes to, to head. Sometimes there were multiple swimsuits worn, so there would be air cavities and air in the swimsuit, um, which would propel the, the, the swimmer faster. But what became really interesting is that the consensus from some of the moderators about the, the Olympics was that these geometric mechanisms of control of the water to make a faster pool had kind of reached their apex. But as we all know, there's always a push for faster and faster. Um, and not thinking about the chemical in terms of the bodies and, 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 um, and chemical enhancements, what did come up was that if we were going to go faster with pools, that the next frontier would have to be the design of the water. Not the geometries of the, of the systems, but actually the chemical composition of water. So for me, this was like a really interesting moment which you're talking about designing the context the body moves through, not the geometries and systems that hold and trap in that system. So for me, that's kind of like an analogy in which thinking you know, if you make a broad sweep, you can say that architecture is essentially an act of mediation. It decides what gets in, what is sort of trapped as a thermal lag, and what is bounced back. Rainer Bannon talks about this as the selective, the generative, or the uh, uh, conservation. And so the question is, can we start thinking about these energy systems that we have around us, not in relationship to the geometries 
that index them and mediate them, but actually can we think of architecture, that pink line, as the context, the active context that we move through? Can we think about energy, the radiation, um, the acoustics, uh, spectrums of light? Can we start controlling those and think of those as, as the architecture itself? So in this kind of this idea here is you have architecture essentially thought of as the bubbles in the water. I mean, it, you know, these are kind of trapped systems. The currents that move around it ebb and flow and pop around it, but are essentially the architecture is defined by that mediating device of a surface. And the question is, can we start thinking about it as an active context in which the pools themselves, and the important thing here is that when we're talking about these materials and energy specifically, is we're making a shift from points, lines, and surfaces of geometries to gradients and intensities. The material properties of energy don't work as lines and surfaces, they work as gradients and intensities. So that has, you know, for this conference today, uh, a lot of ramifications because it changes the way in which we have to represent design and think about them in terms of typology and representation. But again, one of the things that, that I find intriguing, going back to that first slide, is not just the interest in a material for the sake of a material. It's not about running through a new material and seeing you know, what we can do with it because it's there, but it's realizing that the materials and the ways in which we represent those materials have implications spatially and organizationally. And again, if we just go back to, the, to uh, Robin Evans within the developed surface or, or any one of his articles. He talks about, you know, we can look at the, the kind of necklace circulation of a Palladian villa in which you don't have hallways. You basically move from one room to the next room, interrupting the program to get to the next. Um, through the advent of corridors, you start to get destination points, meaning whether it's an elevator core or stairs, these rooms are hermetically separate from each other. They don't require you to move through them. So the surface typology as well as the organizational typology play out um, to have ramifications in how we live and, and how we, we go about our ways. So, my interest in it, like I said, it's, it's an interest and it's a, it's a hunch, is that if we shift from lines and geometries to that of gradients, what then become those organizational ramifications? Like how do we live differently? What are the boundaries that define space differently when we don't work primarily with a surface and a line, but instead a gradient? So just to give you a kind of quick idea about what these, this idea of these pools or these, these gradient intensities are made of, um, is to just talk about you know, the material energies themselves. So we, we do know these material energies in a couple of, a couple of ways. And they're kind of most prim primal basic element that we can think of them as auras. Um, and Jeff Kipnis talks about these as the cosmetic, meaning um, they are essentially byproduct conditions of energy that don't take on any, spatial, any, any kind of spatial load. They require a surface to do work. So whether you're talking about the ecstasy of St. Teresa from, from Bernini, that has the, the marble that looks like it's on a cloud, or the external light, the painting above, that gives you this kind of moment of glows and intensities, or you're looking at the work of Herzog and Dameron, um, and the, kind of, the, kind of the light, the shimmering, whatever it is you're talking about, these kind of effects, atmospheres, moods, qualities. These, things, these are energy systems, but the problem is that it requires a geometry to do the work. If we remove that geometry, that energy goes away and isn't doing anything of architectural load. It's not an architectural material. The flip side of it are comfort control, meaning these are, these are ways in which we can quantify the uh, computation of fluid dynamics. Uh, we have, we have, it's the kind of antithesis of an aura, meaning we have absolute control of them in many regards. We can simulate them, we can work with them in terms of units of measurement. The problem is, though, is we always go back to the idea of a comfort control. We use them as a predetermined condition to have a 72 degree interior with a 45% relative humidity. Um, and the, the way in which, to make an analogy about this, is that if you were to think of St. Peter's or Phyllis and Rock, I mean, these, are, these buildings that we know of today as masterful pieces of architecture are built with the materials that we have around us. They're built with mortar, lime, stone, steel, but they don't reproduce a geological cave. They don't reproduce a geological known artifact. So the question is, why are we using these energy systems, these, these energies, these materials around us, 
simply to produce a preconceived notion of an ideal climate, only to happen on the interior. Um, so with a material energy, you're talking about taking a level of materials, taking that, that energy system and making it a building block material, giving it a spatial load so that it becomes architectural, so, it becomes, so, that, so that it has ramifications should it fail. The idea is that an aura has never failed you as an architect. Like there's, there's, no, there's no consequences to that failure. Um, so for me, a great example of this is street lighting. It's a kind of beginning idea of a material energy. That light has a shape, it has a geometry, it has a condition in which when you're in that light, you have safety, you have, you have a, an element of safety that's associated to it. It stimulates economy, it creates, it's, it's not a reproduction of the sun, it's actually very different, it creates different typologies in the city than, than what we see during the day. But nonetheless, it has energy. And when you're in that edge, you have a level of, of safety, and when you're on the outside of it, that safety dissipates. So you start to get typologies, whether or not it's kind of a necklace of individual pieces, whether it's a continuous corridor that just uh, repeats um, an existing street. But nonetheless, the idea is, how can we start thinking about these materials, whether they're chemical, electromagnetic, thermal, sound waves, as building blocks? And the diagram is especially just to say that as you move out from that, you get comfort controls, you get boards. They become less and less specific as, as kind of building blocks. So, this is a, a little tongue in cheek example of um, the dark, the ionic, and then the equine spire column um, as an example of, of what do we get when we start thinking about um, the shape of energy. Five minutes. Come on. So, I'm just going to read a, a quick piece here. Uh, when shape has been defined, either for its construction or as an image for the presentation of future intentions, it conveys the measurable edges and boundaries of its geographic influence. It provides the ability to represent its influence on the geography it defines and the aesthetic qualities it produces. Shape transmits to the audience not only the existence of its boundaries, but also provides a medium to place value upon it. Shape gives the ability for materials to assemble and receive recognition of the work they do. This value may be determined through perceptions of aesthetics, or it could be the, art, the artifact of the investments by those individuals or institutions that finance them. A discussion of shape might appear to be so fundamental as to not require clarification, but in actuality, shape is exactly what is eluding the architect as it pertains to working with energy as a building block material. Within architecture today, the shape of energy is primarily seen as the mechanical systems that transport it as a fuel for its release. The shapes we give energy are depicted in the technologies that harness it, photovoltaic, wind turbines, fuel cells, or the mechanisms that release it, HVAC systems, industrial designed objects. Innovation is depicted through the shapes of these relevant technologies, but rarely is it associated with the physical boundaries and forms that those energy systems produce when released from these devices. What are the shapes of the gradients, and what are the architectural forms of material energies and architectural constructed with them? One could make the argument that the surfaces and geometries of architecture are used to mediate the environmental context, selecting it, rejecting it, or trapping it onto the interior energy systems, are themselves artifacts of these energy systems. The shapes, the shapes we attribute to architecture are only the armatures which mediate the climate controls that set up the stages for action to occur. It is possible that if we want a glimpse of these fundamental shapes, we need to not only to refocus our attention beyond the technologies and devices that harness and release energy systems, but we must also strip the artifacts we recognize that mediate them as well. Without giving shape to the energy systems that are on the core of our social actions and spatial hierarchies, we are not seeing architecture's most intrinsic forms, and are instead only seeing it through a restoration, uh, restrained filter. By giving shape to the mediated filter, are we refraining from giving shape to the material energies and architectural pools of architecture layered beneath? So just to quickly, I'm going to just show a couple of projects from the design office. Um, and I'm not really going to go into them in detail about the actual project per se, but maybe just the kind of techniques to give an idea of this go back between what I'm talking about and how they're kind of being produced. Um, and I'm showing this one primarily because this is an outdoor garden um, 
in which all the identical geometries were, were identical. But then started working with uh, computational fluid dynamics. This is through cosmos, through heat, and through air velocity. Each of these conditions had um, a heating element, um, a fan, um, this dyed water, which was a tracer. Um, so they're all identical, but they had different, they were turned off to different conditions so that you would potentially get different shapes on the interiors of each of these things during, during the course of the day. So geometry was identical, but hopefully the, uh, the interior conditions would be unique from one to the next. Um, this was, and, I, and I'm, I'm showing these because this was a shift again in which using the, the sea of computation, the, the, the software, but not to look at the interior of the building, but to look at the exterior. And in this case, it was for a public library in which like, the, the program, like the books and such, which were not very malleable in terms of what kind of control they needed were put within this black box. Um, but then a double skin system was created, which was extra large glass system that actually generated more heat than the building needed and it pumped it to the exterior. So by doing that, the idea is to show that even though the geometry of the building you see is, like, is static, throughout the course of a year, those pockets of program spaces could grow or get much larger. So you would define site through a city ordinance as that site line drawn, but in truth, the materialities would actually either grow beyond it or, or sink smaller. So that's just the model. Um, this other one here is uh, for a lakeside in Estonia. I mean, it was a it was a, a 10 hectare uh, redevelopment plan for for the lake. Um, the idea here was was to create an architecture that's lifted off the ground, this building plinth, um, create these large holes within the plinths, and then you had these kind of greenhouse systems that existed above it. That would create an energy system that would then be pumped down into the landscape below. The idea that I'm trying to get to here is that we made a cut plan for the buildings, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Noli plan, like an 18th century plan through Rome that showed public and private through white and black which was a new way of seeing the city through a white and black um, on-off condition. When we did this, though, through the, through, the, through the town, we realized we got a black and white condition, but it wasn't public-private, it was conditioned and unconditioned. So you had the black spaces, which was this, you know, the unconditioned spaces, and then you had these white zones, which obviously are overlap specifically with the surfaces and boundaries of geometry, which trap those heating and cooling. In. So what we tried doing was creating a gradient noli condition of this. And you can see three zones throughout the course of the year. And the intention was that those pockets generated that heat and would then dump that heat down and those, those energy systems which can be converted into a range of materialities into these zones to create these typologies. That clearly, as the winter of Estonia would kick in, there would be a feedback mechanism of the climate that would make them smaller. But nonetheless, there was that, that interaction and growth between the two. And I'm just going to skip here to because um, of time. Just to show you what I want to kind of get at here is this is a this is a, a prototype of a trapped heat cavity that had a heating film and inside is PEG plastic. The idea behind it was that this would generate heat in the trapped air cavity that, as the body came in contact with it, would be warmed. It would also warm the kind of small the area around the body. Each one wouldn't do a lot, but the intention to show here is that as you put them into a field, you start to get these little microclimates outside in the park setting. The bodies that are in silhouette are bodies that are not being into, are not affected by that condition. The ones in the red are the ones that are coming in contact with it. And again, this is going back into the next kind of conversation here, which is how to represent shape of energy, and more importantly, how do you then show social kind of organizations because of it? And this was just another model that had the trapped heat cavity, but in a mound that then was pumped out to the lower areas here. This was in Chicago. Um, and just to kind of, in, in conclusion here, um, there's a kind of going back um, in terms of, of, of representation. And I don't necessarily say what I feel are trends in terms of representation or the digital media in order to working with this, except to say that the kind of two ways in which I'm primarily working now are between, if I escape out of here, I think. No, 
you can see that this is essentially, these are all models. So everything that I've shown today are essentially physical models that are then built and then photographed with backdrops, um, the scale of people that are there and lit, and then run through kind of Photoshop applications to kind of build upon them. So it's always a duality between trying to create a social setting to show what these things can do, and at the flip side, working with the kind of smaller technological devices to try to get them to run and work and operate that can understand and give us a feedback mechanism between the two. Thank you. Both, obviously, both of you are engaged in a kind of a, you know a bottoms up look at, a, a bottoms up way of kind of instrumentalizing phenomenon, whether it's sort of a light, energy, heat, scent, or whether it's you know cultural desires or collective memories of a city. Um, I think Andrea, what's interesting about um, your research is that. It's great to see the uh, discourse of GIS really transforming um, and getting back into the hands of designers. It's been so much uh, sort of tool of planners and less so many designers. And it seems that there's kind of two areas where that's happening um, in terms of the um, both the, the etic and, and, and the emic. Um, and so from the um, from the emic side, what's fascinating is uh, I think one of the most powerful uh, things that you showed was the Invisible Cities Project, the ability to uh, map the sort of, you know, to real-time mine data from Twitter feeds and from Flickr feeds, and to be able to thematize uh, you know, uh, search words and create a visual path and then be able to then map them to a kind of terrain, a, a very immersive sort of environment that you can kind of navigate this data scape. Um, so it, it seems that um, sort of the use of 3D and the use of real time are kind of instrumental tools in both the EDIC and, I'm sorry, the EDIC and the EMIC. Um, so, uh, and, and you, you've obviously asked this question of like how do we approach a kind of bottoms up approach as 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 a as a um, and then in, in terms of the the edic, what's really um, powerful and instrumental again is this kind of real time sort of uh, responsive feedback system. And I can think of a couple examples. I mean, again, you're sort of using social media as a way to kind of mine this the data and respond to it in real time, but also uh, Stephen Morgan had touched on kind of geo design and the sort of development of kind of augmented reality models where um, there's a haptic sort of element of GIS sort of projected on a kind of model and you get able to you know model scenarios and have a kind of real time uh, sort of feedback uh, to that. So you know so I guess uh, to wrap that up it's sort of like GIS is becoming more relevant to designers through kind of the issue of sustainability um, and being able to kind of real time mine these data sets and, and, um, uh, and, and models. And then um, through the issue of really uh, c community and being able to sort of uh, come, to, you know, design ways to query and interface and visualize and represent these kind of uh, data scapes and kind of sort of combine them together. Um, and then, uh, sorry, I'm trying to mesh you guys together. <laughs> um, and then I think, uh, you know, Sean, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of discourse on the subject of atmosphere, uh, and both in terms of theory and cultural production. Um, you know, and, and I think that your work uh, uh, I think the, 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 the discourse has been much higher than the kind of cultural production. 
And I think that your work uh, is great in the way it sort of um, frames the question of kind of landscape and, and the building envelope. Um, and it doesn't sort of devolve into uh, atmosphere or, or comfort. So I think that your kind of discourse and your editorial work with uh, sort of energies is, uh, is a really kind of beautiful way to, to, to frame this. Um, you know, you state that architects treat materials um, existing beyond the external envelope as a given context that the building must associate with or mediate against and, um, and thus develop elaborate envelopes and strategies that attempt to temper exposure to the sort of exterior environment. So for me, for me that really encapsulates kind of what you're doing. And uh, Michelle Addington really kind of picks up on that in a beautiful way and kind of expounds on the history of the sort of thermal barrier as we know it. Uh, and one of her most uh, salient sort of observations is the kind of double wall that formed the skin. Um, that, you know, ironically, um, it's a kind of uh, over-designed system, uh, pr primarily because it's driven through transparency. Uh, so all of these kind of systems are uh, working at the service of sort of transparency. So I think that your discourse is really allowing us to kind of rethink um, the, the building envelope and uh, sort of landscape. Um, and, well, I don't know, maybe Inga, you could answer that. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Um, you know, I think, I mean, I am not to respond really proper. I have, though, as I look at your things, as I'm always hypercritical, I guess, uh, which is unfortunate perhaps, but I had a few questions. Uh, on one hand, I'm extremely uh, intrigued by, let's say, uh, Andrea's mapping techniques, um, because I think they, uh, they definitely shift uh, what one maybe conventionally would have expected. At the same time, what in that mapping, as a, first of all, I'm not so clear about your methodological um, dialectic of these two sides you're trying to put forward, and I understand um, how you back them up to a certain extent, but you could also ask, um, and this is rhetorically, isn't any map anyhow subjective? Um, so, and because of that, then I'm not so sure whether that dialectic is so productive for you. Um, obviously, there are different authorial sources um, of uh, data, and then uh, you could say more social network sources, and obviously these are different, um, and they have a very different agenda behind them. But that's more common. Now, the question is, um, what I would love to hear more about is in how far you could speculate about this less being an analytic tool, but being a generative tool. And I think your last part tried to suggest that. But I really didn't get the relational quality of landscape out of it. Um, so that's one component. And then the other question is, I guess, yes, we have many parameters to look at. But how do we make proper choices? And how for, are these choices become productive? Um, in what we're looking forward as maybe producing or recomprehending as uh, relational landscapes and then perhaps an extension relational architecture landscapes. Um, so that's for you particular. I have another one for you, but I'm pausing now. So uh, it's a good question, and thank you for your comments, both of you. I, I think what I'd, how I'd like to frame that is, is through the idea that this is a process of feedback. So, so what I showed today was some uh, obviously something where the feedback is, is merely the user adjusting these inputs themselves. But I think over time, it's, it's important to consider how these feedbacks can become more dynamic and more uh, operational. These feedbacks could be, as you mentioned, Chris, uh, social network inputs, so rather than uh, the, the user selecting the, the position along this grasshopper slider, it would be rather, say, pulling in certain words from Twitter or certain qualities of images that could, could um, help to uh, add more, uh, more axes to these uh, multi-dimensional things. Um, as, as far as the relational qualities of landscape and how, how the, uh, the mapping can be more generative of design, uh, I think an obvious step would, to be, would be to take uh, some of the uh, infrastructural qualities that are present in the, the research studies, so the, uh, the catalog pages within the site and pull those out and start to apply those on the site. Uh, I certainly agree that looking at a color-coded parcel right now is, is not um, necessarily representational of what types of things should be happening there. But I also want to be very cautious to be too, um, 
instructive of what should happen there, which is really why I avoided form finding with this particular exercise. I don't, I, I don't want to suggest this as a public tool, as something where you're selecting a site and then the site is being designed for you or, or that um, everything is coming from the ground up. I think it, it has to remain fairly flexible at this point in the project in order to, to maintain that idea that this is a public tool. Follow-up questions, maybe on that. Otherwise, I'm going to my next. No, okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, I found it fascinating to rethink everything as what I would call the ecological logics, and I don't mean it in an ecology and uh, maybe one has in, in terms of animal relationships and flora and fauna relationships, but uh, actually taking us uh, into the equation of all of that and thinking of everything in a mutual exchange of, let's say, energy material flows as we used to be in, um, except when we maybe took us, or thinking of ourselves being taken out of the equation and finding ourselves in a modern, highly um, you know, controlled um, environment or climate zone. Um, so, and I'm, the wonder I have with your work is, so I think that is very polemic. I think it's extremely conceptual, uh, forces us all to, I think, rethink what architecture envelopes are but maybe also the interrelationships between the landscape and the architecture. Now then, nevertheless, um, as you showed Palladio almost as already an example of that, that had already existed back then, without uh, polemitizing it through any imagey greenwash or whatsoever, just being architecture friendly. How then can we not lose architecture altogether? That's me as the architect wondering and burying a bit at this point. And yet, keep your project going. Because what, um, let's say my discomfort comes in if I look at your boxes, which um, are these climate zones you're creating, and I still think, boy, am I really, how am I going to work there, or how am I going to live there? Uh, so how would we really start to be, I guess, more critically invested in what are the requirements of architecture space, and yet not using the concept of energy? Um, so I think that's, for me, what I guess I would love to see a projective uh, vision for the future, what are the next steps of your inquiries? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone has their own fears, and um, I can only work with so many of them, but... Here, here. <laughs> um, I don't, I mean, this is the thing, so... The, the, the way I work through those materialities and the material energies is that I, I think, if anything, I see myself more in the realm of the architect. And I say that only because the examples that I gave is that I'm trying to figure out what are, and this is why the way that the, the office works is that we go, I go from doing small scale installations in which you can test and run them, see how they work, see where they fail, and at the same time work with much larger international competitions. And the idea is never to skirt the issues of those competitions. The idea is to win them. And to win them, you have to be responsible for the organizational systems that they want, meaning meeting the needs of a library, meeting the needs of a school of academia. But at the same time, being able to realize that there are other mechanisms and ways of doing that. So for me, as long as the, the, the geographic space can meet those the basic needs of, uh, of activities that are required, regardless of what it looks like, I think it's architecture. You know? And so, I mean, I pushed kind of pretty hard in the sense that it almost sounded like as if I was anti-geometry. But no, but in truth, I'm not. The, the point really was that I just think there needs to be a little bit less of it. I just think like we don't need to, it's a knee-jerk reaction in a way that in order to, and it has a lot to do with the fact that, again, going back to representation or media, is that I, we, we know how to, 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 to make abstractions of geometry and surface cantilevers and such with sketches and lines as, as abstractions. But we don't sketch in gradients. And we, don't, we don't abstract those materials in the same way. Um, so the question is, if we can put them together in, as more of an a priori approach and push back on the other, what then are some of those, those implications? And so for me, I was trying to get across that the energies are really, the materials are my, my means to an end. And my end is that I do think there will be spatial organizational ramifications to architecture if we work with a different way of making a map. We don't rely on geometry and surface, but we slip in another a gradient system. The way we move, the way we interact with each other is going to, to be different. It's not always an a priori, you know where it's going. It's 
sometimes it's a feedback that takes you know, time. You know, the, the corridor didn't just emerge one day as a double loaded corridor. I mean, it kind of came over a period of time. So the question is, as a hunch, and you run through that, I do think the way we interact with each other, the way organizations and programs are set up, will we'll be run through a filter, in a sense. Uh, and I don't think in any way it means you know, the, the loss of landscape architecture or the loss of architecture. Can we just talk about our anxieties? No, since we're sharing. Oh. Um, <laughs> each of you, first of all, thank you both for, for doing this. Um, each of you are um, doubly trained, as it were, and so in terms of your identity, your own formation professionally, educationally, you can claim both sides of that thin membrane. Um, and in some ways, each of you respond to this question already, but I want to draw you out each in your own ways. Um, are there aspects of your project that are particular to landscape architecture, either as a discipline or a profession? Um, I'm pleased to see us playing offense and being doubly trained. And on the one hand, you know, playing across the line with planning, on the other hand, you know, giving the architect some pause, if not discomfort. I think those are healthy, productive moments. Um, but not in, not, not, in, not in themselves. But it's, it ultimately also has to produce a, a cultural condition, a collegial condition, in which um, we can each reflect on our um, problematics in our various disciplines. So could you each say something about what aspects, if at all, of your work do you think might have particular relevance for our uh, questions relative to landscape? And I, I can also say, while well, you're formulating that, that we, we thought that both of your projects were fundamentally relevant to landscape architecture. <laughs> 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 a design future there, or, or there is um, the, the to-be-done housing project or, or a commercial project or, or, or what have you. And, and I think the, uh, the criticality of, of this being a landscape project is that this is not only about deciding if it is uh, an open industrial zone or, or a, a green space, so to speak, um, which is really the only type of zoning there is in Philadelphia, is open space zone. Uh, I think this is more about the uh, allocation of design strategies, and over time these will become more design strategies, but it's fundamentally uh, intended to, to explore the future and to let the user's input uh, have something to do with that, what that future is. Okay. <clears throat> so sometimes the simplest questions are the most difficult ones to answer. And, um, so I'll answer this, I think, just as a, as a designer. And that is to say, I think, for my own personal project and interest, I find landscape architecture to be the point of entry in terms of getting this work done. I think if, if I'm trying to get the work generated and built, going through the realm of architecture, or the arch if defined as architecture, will be more difficult. And it, could, and it has a lot to do with the, with the idea of the, um, the shape of energy is that monetarily, monetarily, putting the money into it and wanting to get a recoup, how do you recoup light, sound, energy, the energy systems? It's very different. You can't try to get a mortgage on that, right? So, <laughs> so I, I do think landscape architecture is the most productive means of entering into that to see the results. And that sounds opportunistically what have you, but I, I do think landscape architecture is like the best way in which the work that I'm doing can can meet an audience and can potentially see fruition. Yeah. Well, I think it's nicely played, and I, I have to say, in a field which has been dominated by a kind of geological determinism and a latent morality, occasional opportunism is not terrible, particularly given the cultural context in which we have to play these days. Um, Sean, you say your instrument is not landscape or architecture, but rather climate, um, which is which is kind of interesting. And, and I agree with you, your sort of comment. I, I see that your primary entry is in, is in through kind of landscape. And uh, I think you're very successful in these kind of amorphous zones of heat and light and scent and these eddies of kind of atmosphere, uh, very suggestive. 
Um, and then when you engage architecture, there's often a kind of um, binary opposition to that, or you set up an opposition where maybe you start to tunnel through the architecture up to microclimates or climatic washes and that sort of thing. But it seems like there's a really interesting opportunity along the sort of idea of threshold. You know, like how these uh, systems can start to re uh, help us rethink how we approach building schemes. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have uh, literally only one minute. If we get five more minutes, we should maybe should open that up for questions. Um, any questions from the audience? Yeah. Do you have a mic? Thank you. Uh, I was very intrigued by the uh, description and depiction of the heat bags. Uh, and I guess as a kind of a heat bag myself, I'm wondering um, how you deal with the perception uh, that human beings would have um, as heat bags moving through um, one of your spaces that you described. And then also uh, for Ms. Hansen, um, <coughs> Could it, could, would it be possible to do a similar study as what you did, but look at the parcels as if they were actually users and choice makers in, in, in their own right? Heat back first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so this is maybe too big of a, of a response. Um, So in the example of, of with, the, with the boxes with, with, the, with thermal, those were internal and they couldn't be they couldn't be occupied. Though when it moved into another project, which I did show, which was the Estonia Academy of Arts, they became these lung systems that moved through the building like a reflected ceiling plan. And the idea was that on the lower level, um, it's where all the mechanical systems were, all the wood shops of the of the academy were placed, and then there was an open plinth, and then all that excess energy would be trapped into these systems that you could move through. Um, and so this is the part that I'm not sure I'll mention, but I will anyway, which is right now when I'm, when I'm working on, when I'm you know, back in Rome, is, is finishing a book that is nearly complete. And, and, and one of the, the, the chapters is about the sensorial envelope. And it's a shift from thinking about the body in terms of proportions and shifting it towards the idea of a sensory perception. And this coincides now with the fact that as a species, you know, as, as humans, we're at the first point where our bodies can technically be improved sensory, sensorially beyond what we were born with. So up for the last 50 years, it's always been, if you were born with a hearing defect or the ability to see, it was always how quickly or how close could you get to average. You know, how close could you, you know, you have hearing aids, you have, you know, whoop glasses, prosthetics. But really within our generation, we're going to get to the first point in which the question is, will the doctor hold back? Will you choose not to actually get a better vision or better hearing than what you should have been born with? So you, you coincide that with material energies, and you start to realize that you not only do you have a material system that we can control as architects, landscape architects like never before, but the human body can sense it in a way that prior to this they could not. So this collusion for me is actually the most exciting part of the whole thing. I didn't talk about it today, but... Wait, but. can I ask a question? No, I mean, so you're saying you're changing the, the human genome towards a different sense of centers? The genome doesn't have to be shifted. It's only a technological extension of all it's, it's a choice. You can actually have it done so that it actually can pass to the next child, or you can choose to have it done so it stays only with you. But they do this in the military now. So if you're going to Afghanistan and you don't have 20-20 vision, chances are when you go in for a LASIK surgery, they're not going to give you 20-20. They're going to give you 10-20 or 5-20. They're going to make your eyes better so that you can actually use the equipment that they have synced to, to, to infrared vision. So the, the point now is occurring where it's not whether or not you should be average in terms of sensory. It's can we make it beyond that? So if you run that course down the hill and we don't need heat anymore. I don't know if I, I have a question. I don't know if I want to say. So I, I think it's an interesting, and I, I want to clarify you're talking about the 
parcel is the one making the decision. So the parcel is, is the person, essentially. I, I think it's an interesting um, way to frame it. It reminds me of uh, the way that Peter Del Tredici uh, framed his uh, talk at the Landscape Infrastructure Conference. Where landscape infrastructure was being seen from the point of view of the plant. And I think that landscape infrastructure certainly can be seen from the point of view of the parcel as well. Um, some of my current studies are looking into um, geolocating, as Christian Schmidt did, uh, geolocating the Twitter feeds and the Panoramio images and the Flickr images uh, so that we can get a better sense of what is on the site right now. This is something that's, that's done in kind of a, a, a mundane way on various real estate sites like Zillow or, or, or whatever, where you can see what the school district nearby is or what the house looks like. But I think that there's a really a much more interesting way of going about doing that. Um, Unfortunately, the amount of data isn't specific necessarily to individual parcels right now, but I do think that over time it will get there. Um, short answer, yes, I think it's absolutely possible, and it's an interesting way to think about it. Long answer, um, how do you combine the, the qualities of the site, which you could argue some of which are more static, some of which are more dynamic, with the changing inputs of the person who uh, is either occupying the parcel or designing it? Because it seems your lecture could also be called the shape of comfort, right? And I think within this comfort, the issue of scale, the macro scale, gets gets into play. And I didn't see so much addressed. I, I understand, or the way that I understood it, it's more on a localized way, more on an architectural and object objectified manner or expression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then I think there's a, an inner contradiction there because comfort it looks to wind, it looks to dread moisture, mm -hmm. phenomena that are beyond the localized scale. Did you see ever, uh, or probably you were doing already that research, this idea of comfort, not being localized, but being addressed on a larger scale, on the, planners, on the planning scale? Um, not so much. Um, I, I am definitely looking at with the material energy is more on the objective in terms of t being able to take on the, the sort of spatial loads of, of activity. Um, that doesn't remove the fact that I'm expecting comfort to be sacrificed. That, but I, I do think so quickly we have a kind of zone of influence that we think we need to work within. And then to do that, we set up armature to make it. And I, I think that, that that zone is actually a little bit wider in terms of comfort than we get credit for, and that those materialities will still produce that, that, that range. It just won't be coming from that as the center point of comfort outwards, but instead of the use of the materiality is kind of coming into that. Um, on the kind of larger regional, to be completely honest, I, I shy away from it a little bit, only because it then becomes a discussion of like, weather control. Like that somehow this is becoming a large you know, geologic weather system where in, in a way you know, that's a pitfall A for the conversation and B not the kind of not the point of it. I think the, the one that's the most obvious that exists today is, is street lighting. I mean, that, that that is that runs from the entire eastern seaboard as, as a as a physical comfort condition. Um, the other way of entering into it is that with all these energy systems that we're talking about, we, we do this anyway. You know, we you know, we talk about creating the climate inside that we're working for, but in truth, we're dumping a huge amount of energy in the back of the building on the roof. There's reflectivity, there's a shadow. I mean, we're, we're changing the, the local. We have, you know, the, one of the best things to do is to go on the Weather Channel and go to the map of Houston and the Doppler, and you see rain, you see moisture all over Houston. It's be, even though it's not raining, it's, but it's just the fact that, that, that that John Heat Island is actually creating from, from all that macadam, bouncing light back, and all the humidity in Houston creates you know, this kind of condition that you can be tracked. So it's going on nonetheless, it's just that we do it as a byproduct. We don't harness it as, as designers, we just let it happen as a byproduct. Um, I think we take one more last question and then we close. Any questions in case there is? Okay. The topic of this was relational, and I am wondering whether um, you, you never 
Hirsch actually showed us a building. This relates to Inga's question, is what happens to architecture. Uh, what, do you, what is the projection of what the building would be? In everything you showed us, they were, they were dark. You know, we couldn't actually see anything. So how does, how is this generative of new spatialities, new experiences, other than comfort, um, and new forms of building? Uh, well, I mean, there, there are two. There's, there's one that was the, the Aspen project, the library, which was trying to reduce I forget the square footage of it now, but let's say it was 200,000 square foot project of, of supposedly programmed interior space. The question is how much of that on a spectrum needed to be climate controlled, how much of it needed to be climate controlled, and what is that, that kind of realm of spectrum. If you could reduce that to the bare minimum of, that's required by geometry, then you're talking about maybe only 100,000 square feet of anything that's, that's kind of encased in, in, a, in a geometry. Which required, which at that point, you're talking about moving the remaining of that program through other mechanisms, through other those material energy systems, which were the, the growing patterns on the outside of that double layered skin. So, and this is what goes back in terms of architecture, landscape architecture. Even though I'm kind of laying the polemic of the material energies, it doesn't mean that you're not going to ever see a geometry or a surface within the system. They'll, they'll always be there, but a kind of rule, another example I'll give is for the Cheltenham Museum, which I didn't show here, which was a museum edition, and our, our whole pitch to them was that they needed 50,000 square feet based on all their layouts. But if they used our system in terms of taking some of the program that they assumed needed to be inside and actually push it below the plate, that we could save them 100, 100 square meters. So our pitch to them was really you don't need as much building as you think you do if you start relying on other material systems. And so organizationally, that has an implication in the sense that it's not all going to, it's going to be, have a different mechanism of organization. And B, it doesn't require the same building uh, scale and production that was assumed was necessary because um, you know, 50,000 square feet was black, and then the loading dock and the outdoor cafe seating was considered outside. And that's a, that's a, that's a predetermined condition. So you slide that back, um, you start to get these conditions. So I may have overloaded a little bit more with the polemic and less of the, the architecture, only because I guess in 20 minutes I was trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, to be continued. Sure.